Well, this morning we're going to continue on with our series. Last uh, week we went about, and what we are is going, uh, ultimately going when the church, when the state becomes God. But I really felt the Lord shift focus. I was going to start with the church in Babylon, but we've gone what actually gets us to Babylon. So if you remember last week we did uh, the road that forces his hand basically. God's nature, we said, is always love and mercy. Uh, he doesn't dispense uh, judgment just willy nilly there's always a reason always a cause he's not an unjust dad where he just beats and abuses his children he's a father that disciplines when discipline is required and so there were things that got us there last year we said what was Babylon known for it's known for idolatry that's it and remember I said about idolatry what is, what is the real attractiveness about idolatry what, is there anything better? I mean, you can either go and do your sacrifices, blood sacrifice in the temple, or you can wander up into the high places and the groves. What's so attractive about doing that? What was the answer? Sexual immorality was at the key of it. Remember I said Huxley's quote, quote he determined in his heart, this was a predetermined act to make the world meaningless. Why? So they can have sexual liberty is what they were chasing. That's at the root of it. Why is it so widely accept accepted, idolatry? And it's always spoken of idolatry and immorality going together. Why is it so prevalent amongst his people? Because they want to be like the world. They want relationships without commitment. They want different forms of relationships, etc., etc. Anyway, so that was last week. So we're moving on from there, moving on to the next topic. But ultimately, that's the root cause as to the road to Babylon. And when you look at the church today, you will see the signs of everything that we're going to speak about. But one of the principal signs that we should be looking for is sexual immorality within the church because that's what brings judgment. And judgment begins at the house of God. Okay? Don't be fooled about this. Uh, God will put up with anything. You need to redefine God or adjust your view of God to see who he really is and who he loves, he chastises. So let's start this morning with a word of prayer and then we'll go uh, from there. Father, we thank you, Lord, uh, for your word this morning. I pray, God, that your word would go forth in truth and in clarity. God, let it be instructional so that, uh, Father, as these times that we're living in come upon us, that we will not be lost, we will not be deceived, but our eyes will be open to what's going on. Father, anything I say this morning that's not of you, blow it away in the breeze, let not one heart or ear catch it. But God, that which is from your lips this morning, that which is inscribed in your diary for today, Lord, let that be established in the heart. Every distraction, Lord, let it go. And Lord, in this next 40 minutes, let the focus of our heart be on your word, Lord, that we might be instructed from your hand. We pray, and everybody said, Amen. Well, when you're in trouble, when I'm in trouble, we may not articulate it, but what we really need is a word from God. What you need is a message from on high. There's a couple of reasons why you need that, because first of all would be for your view of God. Uh, to see God for who he really is. Uh, the other ones would be that you uh, find out what he has planned and make preparation for it. You know, God, we said last week, God is not silent. The reason why judgment comes is because they will not hear. God speaks and speaks and speaks, but they will not hear. So for each of us, we, we, if we think we're living in latter days with judgment on the precipice, well, then in this day, the word of the Lord should be, the trumpets are blaring. Is that right? The alarm's being sounded, but they refuse to hear it. It's not uh, deafness. 
It's willful deafness is what we talked about last week. Okay, so, but if we're in trouble, we need a word from the Lord. In 600 BC, so 2,600 years ago, Jeremiah is announcing to the southern kingdom, uh, to Judah, if you like, uh, in the clearest terms possible, the oncoming onslaught from the Babylonian kingdom. He's saying, no, we're not going to uh, shake this shackle off. We're not going to uh, shake this yoke off as they think, you know, they're not going to break this yoke off our necks. Uh, this is a yoke of judgment that's coming and we're going to endure this. Prepare yourselves for what's coming on. That's the message of Jeremiah. He's weeping. He's pleading with them with his heart. Please don't do this. You'll bring judgment worse. But uh, there were, the response to that was, but it's a very negative message, is that right? Je the message of Jeremiah is very negative. We're not going to win, we're going to lose. We're not going to prevail. Uh, we're not going to form an alliance with Egypt uh, to, to loose this, this uh, menace from our necks. No, we're going into captivity, uh, but make the best of it is what Jeremiah is saying. Do this and do that and it'll be light on you. But they refuse that, and so the, the, the other side to what happens in Judah is we have the rise of false prophets, which is what we're going to be addressing today. False prophets. Prophets who said, well, Jeremiah is such a terrible message. It's a negative message. It's so judgmental. And so we've got a better message. We've got a message that we're going to be wealthy, we're going to prosper, in the midst of all of this, we're going to do great things and our king is going to rule and reign and wonderful things the prophets were going to say. They had a better message than Jer Jeremiah. Uh, and ultimately, Jeremiah was persecuted by these false prophets, thrown into a well, is that right? And mocked and ridiculed and called treasonous. And the reason I'm preaching this today is a very specific reason. And I said last week, I'm not going to go through. Normally, I would have a video that goes up and show you example after example. But that's fruitless because as we go on, there'll be more and more of these things arising. And what you need is the, cool, the tools and the characteristics to identify these guys. And so we're going to focus on those tools, tools to put in your toolbox so that when you see these things on TV or hear these things in different meetings, you'll say, ah, ooh, and you'll know. Does that make sense? That's sort of how we're going to go uh, if we can. So we'll see whether people can pass the sniff test, all right? Okay, in this day, we need discernment more than any other. Is that right? Because if we are heading in the latter days, deception is the key theme when we look at Matthew 24. Three times more than anything else it's spoken of, do not be deceived, beware lest, etc., etc. And off we go. Well, let's start off with something really basic and Deuteronomy 18. If you've got your Bibles with you, uh, hopefully you have, um, let's go to Deuteronomy and chapter 18. And we're going to... First, ask the question, if we've got to be wary of these people and, uh, and we're looking out for them, um, we need to know what is a false prophet. And that's a, that should be a fairly basic question. But the reason why I'm going through it is because in Christendom today, you'll have people who meet the criteria that we're going to talk about, and yet the church refuses to call them a false prophet. But the definition is clear. So... Even though it's so basic, I've got to go through it, okay? So let's do it. Deuteronomy 18 and verse 20, and it's in many times. You'll see it a couple of chapters early in Deuteronomy as well. Similar thing. Verse 20, it says, But the prophet who presumes, presumes uh, to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. Now, in the New Testament, we're not into uh, physically murdering people, but we are to stone them, that is to use the, the thing that God has ascribed in stone, his word, to bring these people down, okay? That's what we're to do. Okay, so they shall die. And if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has spoken? So you're listening to somebody speak a word. You're saying, how do we know that this is a word from the Lord? 
Will we know in the meeting that it's a word from the Lord? Well, I tell you what, some words you will know they're not the word of the Lord. Some you will not know whether it's a word from the Lord or not. The next verse tells you how you will know. It says this. When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, so he invokes, I've been in many meetings, people say this, and the Lord says, and they announce something. Right? So this is what he's saying. When they speak in my name, the Lord says... If the thing does not happen or come to pass, so if it doesn't happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. Listen, it's easy to define a false prophet. The false prophet says, this shall happen. I'm speaking in the name of the Lord. The Lord's going to say this, and it doesn't happen. Then he is defined by definition of Deuteronomy 18, I am God, I change not, but as a false prophet. Now, I want to be clear here, simply because I'm recording it, it may go out to a wider audience. I am a believer in the gifts of the Spirit for today. I've been and experienced true words of the Lord that have come into particular situations in my life and in members of my family's life, things that nobody knew about, but the Lord spoke and announced in a, in a, in a, uh, a, a word of knowledge through the uh, gifts of the Spirit in operation at a me- meeting where he identifies things in your life, something that's coming that you make, make preparation or something like that, things at the time that were unthinkable, and yet they were announced in a meeting. I hit them in my heart. Only when the events happened later, I knew that was from the Lord. I knew exactly that. So I want to be clear that I believe in the gifts of prophecy, words of knowledge, uh, as biblically spoken. Okay? But be clear, if you speak, I mean, I've been in meetings where people will babble all sorts of things in the name of the Lord. Listen, God takes that very, very seriously. You don't just get up and say, the Lord says, or I have a word from God for your life, brother, and speak something that's just on the top of your head or in the concoction of your heart. No, you will know. God speaks, lays on your heart, gives you a scripture of some description. You will know that is God. I tell you why you know, because your immediate reaction is, I can't say that. I won't, you know, I don't want to share that. And, and it'll get vindicated and... Be careful when you speak in the name of the Lord, if you speak it presumptuously. But the golden test is this. If you speak a word from the Lord and it doesn't come to pass, you're a false prophet. And if you've done that, you need to repent. You need to repent. Okay, so that's, let's just get that definition out of the way nice and clear, okay? But that you'll find in Christendom today, in churches today, there are people who have given many, many prophecies that define dates, uh, plans for people's life that never came to pass, and yet they're invited back year after year as a prophet and to the church and so-called giving times and seasons and insight about what's happening in Australia and the spiritual powers. They're speaking presumptuously in the name of the Lord. They need to be rejected, set apart, stoned with the proper word of God. Here we go, four characteristics. When we look at false prophets, there are characteristics that we see, and we're obviously reading this from the book of Jeremiah, the church going into captivity. So these things are going to be present. I want you to look, as we look at it through the lens of Jeremiah, be aware that you should be looking and you'll identify in our day the things that we'll see in these type of people and they're abounding in our generation, which is uh, some of the vindication that we're heading into the precipice of God's judgment. Okay, if we're not already there. Jeremiah 6.14. So you will be in the book of Jeremiah. Be easy. We'll stay there for a lot of it. There's a few New Testament scriptures. But if you do have your Bible on your phone or, or, um, or with you, Jeremiah 6 is what we're looking at. And we're going to start with verse 14. Jeremiah rails against these false prophets over and over and over. And he starts off with this. Uh, it says, uh, They have healed the hurt of my people slightly or lightly, saying, Peace peace when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they have committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed nor did they know how to blush. Therefore they shall fall among those who fall 
at the time I punished them. They shall be cast down, says the Lord. What's these false prophets saying? They're saying, listen, you don't need the Lord. You don't need to repent of what you're doing. You don't need to acknowledge your sin. Just come to the Lord. You don't need to change. You'll be fine. We'll just pray for you. Yes, you've got some problems. Of course, everybody's got problems. The Lord knows that's just who you are. That's what the false prophets say. There's no challenge on any uh, immorality, idolatry, repentance of sin. None of that comes into the fray. It's simply on the base of humanity. They come say, listen, you can solve your own problems. Yeah, good. go and see a psychologist. Cause that thing founded on the very things that are against God's word, but that's fine. Go and talk about it if you need a paid friend. All these things that come in the false prophets, they will acknowledge these things. They heal the wound lightly, but they never are able to get to the deep-rooted pain that resides in the human heart. Only God can solve that problem of guilt and shame that ultimately comes. But they are past that, you'll notice. Because it went on and said, they're not ashamed. They do abominable things, as we'll see in these characteristics, but they're not ashamed. They've forgotten how to blush. Remember when you were young or something, and someone would say, oh, Paul, have you got a girlfriend yet? Oh, and you get all right. You knew you were blushing. You know what I mean? It was, oh, well, they've forgotten that sensation. They can do the most horrendous things, even criminal things, and they're not ashamed. They don't blush at all. This is some of the characteristics. Anyway, we start off with the first uh, characteristic, if you like, if you're taking notes. And I apologise up front uh, for my handwriting. Okay, so the first characteristics that we see about a false prophet is that they diminish the holiness of God. If we can just flick over one page earlier... And Jeremiah 5 and verse 12, it says, um, They have lied about the Lord and said, What do they say? They lie about the Lord. How do they lie? Because they say, it's, is it, uh, it is not he. Neither will evil come upon us, nor shall we see sword or famine. Listen, they say this, Jeremiah, you're too judgmental. Jeremiah, you're too negative. Right? You know, we're not going to profit. I mean, who's going to be able to get up a collection giving negative words from the Lord? Yeah, you know, you're not going to be able to do that. So you never hear that. You hear great words from the Lord. No evil's going to come upon you. You're going to have a wonderful life. You're going to prosper. You're just going to go from mountain top to mountain top, soar on eagles' wings, and all this sort of stuff. That's what you're going to hear. And the word of the Lord comes, no evil's going to befall you, no judgment's coming whatsoever, is what they say. That's not the Lord, that's Jeremiah. We need to reject that. So they come and belittle. There's no call to repentance or the sin of the nation or the sin of the individual. There's no call in that way. Their call is, oh, just come. Just come, the Lord's going to accept you. There's no evil to be, be befalling anybody here. You know, it, the Lord's got, what's the plan, the one they use there? The Lord knows he's got a great plan for your life and it's going to go up and up and up and up. Well, that's their, that's their call. His word's always encouraging. The word of the Lord's always encouraging. Is it? Is it? What got you saved? Well, it's his kindness, but it's his kindness in identifying the sin in your life and graciously and mercifully and lovingly bringing you to truth is what we're talking about. They diminish the holiness of God by saying no disaster will come. God's not going to judge us because, after all, the whole idea of judgment's not in vogue anymore. Is that right? In fact, we'd say things along the lines that really, ultimately, ultimately, everybody's going to end up in heaven anyway. In fact, you've got evangelical preachers out there now saying that hell doesn't even exist or won't exist for eternity. After all, in the end, in the end, we all win, don't we? That's what the false prophets are saying. They diminish the holiness of God. What they want, they don't want a father in heaven. They want a grandfather in heaven. A grandfather has the grandkids over and he watches them play and they might be mischievous and a bit naughty here and there, but a grandfather looks on and enjoys it. And when they come to pick, pick, picking up the kids, he says, Oh, well, 
few things here and there, but really at the end of the day, a great time was had by one and all. That's what they want in heaven, a God that is like a grandfather. But a father takes a different approach. He's got to deal long term with these children, and so he needs to instruct them. So that's the false prophets. People go shopping today seeking a God who's made in their image. Uh, they say uh, they have a God of self-authentication. They have a God of prosperity and wealth. Uh, they've got a God of sexual preference. Whatever it is that they want, God becomes to them. That's what they are. Listen, that's not a biblical thing and God says some harsh things about prophets, false prophets that say such things. First thing you look for, first characteristic, is that they diminish the holiness of God. Okay, number two is they exaggerate human nature. And what I mean by that is they exaggerate the goodness of man. Okay, Jeremiah 5.30, we're there anyway, so let's just turn the page back over. And Jeremiah 5.30, and it says, An astonishing and horrible thing um, has been committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule by their own power. False prophets and pastors who are ruling by their own authority, their own rules, no reference to scripture whatsoever, no basis to run a church in that way. We're simply doing it under business principles or any other principle that they come up with that they see fit. The, the, you understand the two running together, false prophets and priests or pastors that run the show their own way. Hello? Anyone seen churches like that? Okay, and listen, this you would think though, when people are in these churches, they hate this stuff. But the word goes on and says, no, my people love to have it so. But God says, but what will it be in the end? What will it be in the end? See, it says this, you don't have to change, you don't have to confront your sin. It's, listen, we'll have healing meetings because it's more important that you be healed than that you be holy. They have healing conventions, they don't have holiness conferences. Because it's more important that you be healed as a person. We're exalting the human nature than it is that you be instructed in holiness. And so they, they have something along those lines uh, that they go, listen, the Bible says in Genesis that God was created, that man was created, sorry, in God's image. Is that right? But the sinful man reverses the equation and does make God in his own image. And this is the characteristics of the false prophet. It's not God molding us. It's us getting God to mold into what we want to achieve. That's where we come. That's where they go. And so uh, the exaltation of human nature. You've got people on TV, current false prophets, if you have Christian TV, and you'll hear phrases along these natures. You'll see uh, th phrases like this. You've been born for earthly greatness. And when you hear those words, you say, yes, I have been born for, human gra for earthly greatness. Especially, I remember being your ages here, young, and I thought, I've got so much to offer God. It took years of God bashing to get that out, to see that I have nothing to offer God. He has everything to offer me. But at this excitement of the moment, I'm born for earthly greatness. Wow, what a stroke of pride. Oh, lovely. I'm born for earthly greatness. He says this, you need to imagine, these are the phrases, you need to imagine in your mind. Prosperity and wealth prosperity and wealth, just think about those things and have them clearly in your mind and thinking about those things and speaking the right words will bring them about. It's magic. You have the power within yourself is what they say because God is in everyone, isn't he? No. To them that repent, he gives the power to become the sons of God. But he says you've got this power within yourself to be anything you want to be. Just think it and speak it. All you need to do is think. 
Well, Jeremiah has a slight rebuttal to that, and we all know it. In Jeremiah 17, very popular word this that Jeremiah gave to these false prophets, and he says, uh, verse 9, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? But the next verse tells you, I, the Lord, search the heart, I test the mind. Listen, God knows. He knows the things about us that we don't even want to acknowledge. God knows those things that we will not admit to. God knows those things. He knows what you thought about this week. He knows the thoughts of rebellion. He knows the thought of immorality, thoughts of lust, th thoughts of dishonesty. Th he knows all those things that have gone through our mind. He knows all. your heart is deceitfully wicked. What a tool to try and form God into. False prophets tell us the opposite. They say, listen, guys, you're really wonderful people. You're such wonderful people that really all you need to do is try harder. And surely God will accept us. That's the message of the false prophets. Completely devoid of the Christ that says, come and take up your cross, follow me, die daily, be crucified, get rid of the old man, bury the guy. No, 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 you're a wonderful person. you just got a few rough edges here and there. That's the message of the false prophet. Okay, here's another one. Number three, when you're looking at the characteristics, they've got various... Forms of, or sources, I should say, various sources of knowledge. Okay, Jeremiah 14 is where he starts to address these. Jeremiah 14, let's go there, and verse 13. 14, verse 13. It says, Then I said, Our Lord God, behold, the prophets say to them, you shall not see the sword, nor shall you have the famine, but I will give you assured peace in this place. Same message as we're saying before, isn't it? No evil will come upon you. Peace when there is no peace. Same thing going on. And the Lord said to me, the prophets prophesy lies in my name. Okay? I have not sent them, commanded them, nor spoken to them. They prophesy to you a false vision, a divination, a worthless thing or worthless divination, and the deceit of their heart. Three sources that we're looking at here of false prophets, and you'll know them as soon as I tell them. A lying vision, okay? How often have you seen on television, you're watching the TV, if you're watching Christian TV, and the most bizarre thing in the world can be attributed to God because some bloke has had a vision. Is that right? They've had some sort of dream, some sort of vision, and something that can even be completely unscriptural can be uh, attributed to God. Why? Because some bozo has had some dream. Or he tells you that he's had a dream of some description. And furthermore, if you begin to question, I've been in churches like this, someone gets up and pronounces some vision, some dream, then you begin to question, it might be the pastor, you begin to question that dream, and suddenly, suddenly, hey, You've touched the Lord's anointed. And not only, it, it, it's, it's, you're not allowed to question, or if you do question, the ramifications, same with the ones on TV, the ramifications of questioning these people would be that something detrimental comes to you. Has anyone received one of those emails, and it, you read it, and at the bottom of the email it says, if you don't pass this on, something bad's going to happen to you. Who's ever sent it on to the other three people? <laughs> Just delete it. But that's what they say. If you question, somehow there's going to be bad, there's bad aura around you. You know what I mean? There's bad luck coming your way. There's something because you're not walking in the spirit. How you're so judgmental. You know what I mean? That's, but I mean, Deuteronomy 18 tells you to judge how you know it's from the Lord or not. You come to pass or it didn't. They start, one of their tools of their knowledge, these false prophets, is these dreams that they have. I remember one guy getting up and he's, uh, he said, hold, everyone hold up your wallet. And he said, speak to your wallet. Be filled with money. I mean, that might work in a meeting, but really? Really? Can you imagine showing that to your unsaved workmates? Hey, fill it with money. Another one said, I remember this one. Uh, you might recognize it. He said, oh, I'm just having a revelation now. 
the Lord's just shown me that there's actually nine members to the Trinity. <laughs> oh, really? And everyone's in the meeting. Oh, oh, the Lord's just revealed a new truth. Has he really? Has he really? False, false visions that we're looking at. Luther, in, in Martin Luther's time, he also had many false prophets at the time there. And you know what he said about the prophets in his time? He said, because the Holy Spirit is oftentimes related as a dove. Is that right? The dove descended upon him, etc., all this stuff. Martin Luther said this, I would not accept one of their prophecies if they swallowed the Holy Spirit feathers and all. But these visions that they keep having, I've had a dream, I've seen a vision, the Lord put me in a trance, I saw this. These are the tools and the sources of knowledge of false prophets. I'm not saying there's not uh, visions that can be real and things along those lines, but I'm saying don't be so gullible as to accept every... And I should say that every person that's on TV, not every person on TV is a false prophet. But you will find them on TV, I can tell you that much. Okay, the second one that we're looking at, uh, as, so we've got um, uh, false dreams. Okay, I've had a dream, and here we go. And then we've got false, false dreams, and the next one is, oh my goodness, worthless divination. Here we go. Here, this is, this is interesting, interesting, uh, because... Some people say, oh, I just watch these guys anyway. They've got such a powerful ministry. They're so, you know, good to listen to and exciting in the meeting and stuff like that. All great. Uh, but listen to this. Worthless divination. Do you know divination is actually an occult practice? Yes. Yep. It's an occult practice. One of Satan's most dazzling displays, dazzling displays, is to have someone speak in a meeting and they think they're connected with God but they're actually being controlled by demonic spirits and doctrines of devils. But they think they're connected with God. Remember, your heart is so deceitfully uh, deceitful to you that it's impossible to know without the word of God dividing rightly that thing. They have no, but they think they're speaking the word. They are convinced they are speaking from God. Second Corinthians, Peter uh, makes it clear. Second Corinthians eleven. Uh, 12, sorry, uh, Paul, it says, but what I do, this is Paul speaking, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion, and sorry, I've taken this, uh, when you look at the Greek, you, you look at the Derby translation and the W-E-B translation, and I think it gives a clearer picture of some of the words. You, you might have a different one in the King James and, um, and the uh, ASV, but the word that's used there is the same as this one. I checked it in the Greek, okay? So I'm just going to quote it from those versions just to make it clear. But what I do, that I will do, that I might cut off occasion from them that desire an occasion, that in which they boast. Yours will say something, the glory. Is that right? In that? No, you haven't got there yet. So 2 Corinthians 11, verse 12. Okay, sorry, I may have quoted that. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 12 something in glory, but it's that in which they boast, they may be found even as we are. Paul says, I'm going to persist in this thing because the, the deceitfulness that they're showing is so close to the real thing that I've got to, got to um, uh, that they might be found even as we are. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, masquerading as Christ's apostles, and no wonder, because even Satan masquerades as an angel of darkness. No, an angel of light he masquerades as. And listen, but verse 15. And it's no great thing, therefore, if his ministers also masquerade as servants of righteousness. What does that tell you? That in the lump of Christendom, that there's demonic powers at work here that are in Christendom, and you would assume, given some of the other parables about the birds in the top of the tree, that there are some things here that are not quite right in Christendom. In fact, you can look for it in churches, you can look for it in, in wider Christendom, that there will be some people in there that are not of God, but they masquerade as uh, servants of righteousness. That's how they masquerade. But whose end will be according to their works, just like God said about the false prophets. Okay, 
So some are overtly using divination, uh, but, but they use divination in the church of God, but they are oftentimes using the name of Jesus. O oftentimes using the name of Jesus. You say, well, how can they be using divination and uh, talking about Jesus all the time? Well, very clear, because if you look at the same chapter there and you go to verse 4, Peter talks about that as well. He says, because he, if he who comes preaches another Jesus. Okay, so we can talk about Jesus all we like, is that right? There's all sorts of Jesuses out there. There's the Jesus of the Mormons, the Jesus of the JWs, Santa Claus Jesus, the Jesus of your self-authentication, the Jesus of the wealth and you know, prosperity stuff. There's all sorts of Jesus out there. What I'm trying to say this morning is make sure the Jesus you have is the Jesus that's contained in that book. Because if it's not that Jesus, you've got a false Jesus. You've got another Jesus, and you need to be very clear. And uh, there's all kinds of Jesus out there. Listen, they proclaim Christ. These false prophets, they proclaim Christ. You turn the channel on, you'll hear Jesus this, Messiah that, Most High over here, and all the, and you tick, tick, ding, 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 Jehovah. You hear all the cats for Christ. But listen, it's not the Jesus of the Word of God. They're not talking about the Jesus who calls you to die daily. They're not talking about the Jesus who tells you to take up their cross and follow me. They're not talking about the Jesus that commands men everywhere to repent. That's not the Jesus they're talking about. They're talking about the Jesus that empowers you from within to harness the forces of God to achieve greatness in this earth. That's the Jesus they're talking about. Third source that they've got is the deceit of their own mind. Deceits of their own minds. Listen what they do. They look at the desires of their own heart. What do I really deserve? What do I really want? Then they fashion God to come after that to let them achieve that which they want out of their own heart. Who has ever thought something was right only to find out that their heart had deceived them on that issue? I've had that happen many times. Many times. What they're doing is they're, the, the key thing for them is their desires in their heart. And they want a God that's going to, they, they remake God in their image, in their desires, to facilitate what they want. It, and the New Testament tells you, because Jude chapter 1 says this, For there are certain men who crept in secretly, even those who were long ago written about for this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. Now what's that? That's pleasure, relaxation, whatever your own desires are. You know what I mean? This is, I want an easy life. I want a cruisy, you know, beautiful. That's what they're, they're looking at there. But they deny their only master, God and Lord Jesus Christ. They start with this premise. They say, what do I want to do? What do I want to do? And God becomes whatever they need. But listen to the words of God. He says, I am who I am and not who you want me to be. That's the difference. They start with the premise, what do I want to, what do I want to achieve? What sort of greatness lies in me that I want, you know, needs to come out? God's going to have a great plan for my life. He's going to avail me to do this. No, God says, I am who I am, and I change not. Okay, number fourth characteristic out of all of this, and we'll try and move quickly, is they hide. They are not open. about their motives. They hide their motives, okay? The scripture's pretty plain on this, and we'll go through some of the scriptures. It says they are not just susceptible, not just have a bias, it says they are trained in greed. They, are, they know the sales techniques. Don't worry about it. When you're listening, you're going to send them. You're going to buy the book. You're going to get the DVD. You're going to buy the series. You're going to want that 
that crystal thing that has that scripture on it. You're going to want that because at the end of the day, they've adopted every sales technique. They're trained in greed. They know how to come over to you, Graham, and just reach over and grab that wallet and take out whatever they need out of there. They're trained in that stuff. 2 Peter 2.1. Listen to these. These are great characteristics. When you're looking at the television, look for this stuff. Uh, 2 Peter 2.1. But there also arose false prophets among the people, and among you also there will be false teachers. These two things run together always. False prophets, false teachers. Look at the book of Revelation. Got the same thing going on. False prophet, antichrist, all that sort of stuff running together. These two... Uh, co-joined at the hip, who will secretly bring in destruct destructive heresies. They start off, everything's sweet, but secretly they begin to bring off the wall stuff in, right? Denying even the master who bought them, same scriptures we had before, bringing on themselves swift destruction. Same pattern all over the place. Verse 2, many will follow, listen to that, listen to this, key thing when you're looking at their lives, right? Judge the fruit is what the scripture says. It says many will follow what? their immoral ways okay so when you're looking look there okay and as a result the way of truth will be maligned is that true there's some people on television that people you can't witness to people because they say oh look at that guy on the tv for goodness sakes i saw this fella doing this the truth is maligned because of these fellas okay listen in covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive Words, okay, whose sentence now for, uh, and of old uh, doesn't linger and their destruction will not slumber. Verse 13, they receive the wages of unrighteousness, people who count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. These are the guys that love the big conventions. And at the conventions, it's like a, it's like a theme park. You know what I mean? You've got all sorts of activities going on. They're, they're party animals. Don't worry about it. You're going to have a good time. You're locked in with a false prophet. You'll have a great time because they are these sort of people. They're, they revel in the daytime. You know what I mean? We're going to have a party today and the event is so much fun. We've got balls bouncing around the, the stadium. You know, we've got activities that are on the side. We're going skiing here. We're going... Oh, look, none of this is bad. I'm just trying to say these are the characteristics they have that their conventions will be not word-centred, but activity-centred. Yeah, the, the, the thing that you took away from the convention was, I had a great time riding the buck and bull. Not, what a wonderful man of God, what an expounding the word of God. That will be secondary because it's revelling in the daytime is what's going on there. Okay. Um, Yep, verse 14, having eyes full of adultery. Remember, adultery, um, immorality, immorality, idolatry, all running the same thing. They're all the same thing. Who can't cease from sin? Enticing, unsettling souls, uh, having a heart trained in greed. That's what we said before. They are not just leaning towards it. They're trained in greed. Okay. Uh, forsaking the right way, they went astray, having followed the way of Balaam and son of Beor, who loved the wages of wrongdoing. Listen, this is, the, this is the catch cry. They love the wages of wrongdoing. They're not ashamed. They don't blush. They say this, send me money. When you get down past all the message and everything, the ultimate is, send me money. And that money will become seed money. And that seed money is going to get you a great harvest. So really, they're training you in greed at the same time. The only reason you, you wouldn't give them otherwise, you want money back. Is that right? You, it's, it's like playing the pokies. I had a client in and he said, I said, how much did you put in? He said, I won uh, some money in the pokies. I said, how much did you put in? He said, I put $800 in. Over the course of the weekend, he put 3500 in. He, he won 12 and a half, believe it or not. I said, that's the worst thing that can happen to you because now you're vindicated, you go back next week and speed, spend the other three and a half. But I mean, who would sit there and put that sort of money through? But they're, they're, no problem for them. Okay, so we've got one guy on TV regularly asks for a thousand, send me a thousand dollars seed money. Great harvest, thousand dollars. One, one guy, I know it's on the internet, he went in and had a look at uh, all his affairs this guy is worth $14 million. What is he doing asking you and me for $1,000? Five 
5,000, there we go. Five, but you get five times the harvest, reader. Five times, think of that. You can't outgive God, give him five times more. Listen, the tragedy of this, my, I, I hate preaching this rubbish. I really hate it. It shouldn't even have to be dressed. But the fact of the matter is that the people that are sending this money in are the sick and the poor. People who are desperate and need the hand of God to move in their lives and they're desperate and these are the sort of people that are sending in their last thousand dollars. And if you see this guy on TV, he's powerful. I mean, he speaks powerfully. He's very persuasive, even scriptural sometimes. But I tell you what, he's a false prophet by any other name. False teacher. Okay, there's another guy I saw, he said this, if you send me money, if you send me money, we've got a God for hire. That's why he links it to Balaam the prophet when we talked about before. Because, you know, there's only a donkey that stopped him. But, you know, he's a God for hire is what we're talking about. He said, if you send me money, your mortgage will be miraculously paid. You'll get a letter from the bank saying your mortgage has been paid out. Well, mate, I'd give to anyone who could do that. If they could walk on water and make my mortgage repaid, I'd give him some money, you know what I mean? Well, the guy that heard that actually went and visited the, um, the locality where this guy had, had actually, this meeting had taken place. And um, he spoke to the local pastor and said, did you know about this claim? He said, oh, oh yes, yes, we know about that. He said, in fact, I went around and tried to vindicate. And you know what I found out? I found out that this man collected thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars and not one mortgage was paid out miraculously. <laughs> I was in a meeting once and then one guy stood up, got a word from the Lord. Everyone in this meeting's mortgage will be repaid in 12 months' time. The place went ballistic. I felt like going ballistic. Yeah, baby, the mortgage gone. Hallelujah. Of course, I knew it was rubbish. Twelve months later, I looked around and everyone was in more debt. They bought new cars. And new, you know what I mean? It was just ridiculous. Oral Roberts, great guy. Listen, I'm only going to mention two fellows by name here. Old examples, but they give you the flavour of these guys. Trained in greed. Covetous. Immoral. These are the characteristics we're looking for, is that right? They never tell you the true motives, but in 1987, Oral Roberts gets on the TV and he says these words. I've just had a dream God spoke to my heart and it's as real as I could ever think, he said. And I need $8 million by the end of the week or God's going to kill me. He's going to take me home. $8 million, hey? Woo! Well, he died at 91, so eventually he didn't raise enough money for God to keep him here. But, you know, $8 million came in in that week to say, this guy had, a, imagine raising $8 million in a week. Well, God was going to take him home. Is that the God you and I serve? Is God uh, trying to extort? That's what the mafia does, isn't it? Knock on the door and say, pay up the protection money. You know what I mean? God, that's not God. He's got the wrong God. That's Oral Roberts. Uh, but anyway, they did it, and uh, the death threat worked, and he got his money. Uh, another time, he had a 900-foot-tall Jesus that appeared to him and said, listen, we need to raise $120 million. We're not talking about small sums. $120 million? Man, do the math on that. You couldn't spend $50,000 a week on the interest, never mind eating the capital. This guy, $120 million he's got going on. He said it was to build a hospital. Uh, he said the devil tried to strangle him in his bedroom only to be driven away by his wife. Special... <laughs> Maybe she was one of the same. Special holy water sprinkled... Listen to this. Special holy water sprinkled on his billfold. Get your wallets out, guys. I've got some water at the back of the tap. Put it on there. Uh, we'll bring prosperity, right? God told him he would return from the dead to rule over the earth. Um, Listen, he has left a legacy, uh, Oral Roberts, because he's got the Oral Roberts uh, University in there, uh, mainly serving as um, his son and his, his son's wife run the joint. Uh, unfortunately, in 2007, 
uh, his wife spent the school, model to remo uh, school, school money to remodel their home 11 times in 14 years. Now, I understand fashions change, but 11 times in 14 years, and probably only delayed by the tradesmen, you know what I mean? I don't know, 14 times. She used to employ her underage male associates, this is the wife, um, uh, so male friends, and she would spend $39,000 a pop on clothes at Chico's and fly their daughter to Orlando for the spring break on a private jet. Also, the, it's alleged that um, they forced the university professors and teachers to do the daughter's homework. I mean, this is what I'm saying. When you look at these guys, the lives, the immorality that surrounds them, uh, that's the hallmarks. Inspect the fruit of these guys because there's always... Check the family out. See what's happening with the kids. And you start seeing the fruit of the tree. Okay, so uh, money is the key thing, of course, because they're trained in greed, covetousness, but uh, immorality. You know, you look for how many marriages they've had. Have they been faithful with the one wife for the whole time? You know, or is this the third, God, third woman that God's given me? Hello? You know? Hello? Anyway, another guy I went through, and we're getting to the end of it. Uh, I went to a meeting once uh, locally here, John Avanzini. Anyone heard of him? Okay. And in that meeting, the offering went round four times. Four times. Woo! I think people there were putting wish wristwatches and stuff like that in by the end of it, you know, trying to make a memorial gift that would turn the hand of God. Listen to me. God doesn't need your money to intervene in your life. He needs your heart. If he gets your heart, he'll get your money. Is that right? You're not trying to bribe God to do a miracle. These people are trained in greed. To them, it's a game of manipulation. I wish we didn't even have to preach in this area. But for them, they manipulate the sick and they manipulate the poor to get the money out of them. For them, it's a game. And false promises that are not based on God's word. But they're, they're, the reason why we're talking before is because uh, that boasting, I wanted to use that um, that. Uh, translation before because when it says glory it doesn't tell you these guys are boastful men they boast in what the Lord can do listen please don't be deceived by these people sometimes God's people can't tell the difference between grass and astroturf they're lost listen I love to raise money for the poor and needy those that can't read it that get money for themselves but I never promise anyone who gives that they're going to get any special favour from God, that they're going to get anything out of that other than the gift that God gives when you give something to someone else that's in need. What a beautiful thing that is. God's not interested in what sort of filthy motive is that. Imagine if I did that with my kids. I'm only giving you breakfast because it's going to give something back to me. What sort of dad does that make me? You know what I mean? Here's a toy, but I'm only giving that to you because I know that I'm giving you this toy car. God's going to give me a real car. <laughs> you know what? But when you break it down, it's ridiculous, isn't it? Okay. Just give because there's a need. Be a giver. Be a giver in life. That's what I'd say. The other motive that they hide, because we're talking about hiding motives, and it is the, the motive of pride. And that's why when we read, read that before, uh, it says that they desire an occasion. These guys are not shy. If an opportunity comes up, I want to fill that. I want the head of the table. I want to make that program. I want to be on TV in these many countries. I want to do... I, 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 I will arise. I will, I will... Yep, yeah, that sounds like someone else, doesn't it? Out of Scripture. In the book of Isaiah. I will ascend to the most. I will... That's what these people do. They boast. I'm on TV in 27 countries. I need more money so we can get in here. I want to get into China. Send me your, you know, send me the seed money. All this sort of stuff. They go on. They're boasters about, you know, oh God, I got here on a private. God gave me three jets. You know, fantastic. They're dressed up there with a Rolex that's worth, I don't know, five grand, six grand, or something. What is the point of showing off a Rolex? I had a Rolex, I got it straight from China, and it's now broken. A bit came off and the hand can't move anymore. That's probably the third time I fixed it, you know what I mean? It was, it's a great copy, but it's <laughs> useless. I got it for about 120, I think, for two. 
useless. But what is the point in trying to flash? John M. Vanzini, man, the hair was done up. Woo! He had it all styled, must take four hours to get the hair right. The suit was pinstripe and everything's picture perfect. The tie was just so, with a little crevice on there, the little United States style. The shoes, man, you could just about do your teeth in them. Oh, you know, look at that. Oh, you could see yourself in the shoes. The guy is so flashy. They're prideful. But what does the poor and the desperate look at? They say, these guys, I, I'm so desperately poor. He's saying, if I can just give a little bit, I can live like he lives. God is going to bless me and I can just keep giving more and more and more and get more and more. And eventually, this is the road out. It's a deception and it's false doctrine and God hates that stuff. And these guys are coming down at the end of it all. They stay through the whole time, but when it falls, they go. Okay, so Jeremiah had put up with them all the way. These guys boast about what they're able to do. They and, and the feeling, I remember having this feeling when I was an early Christian watching these guys. The, they, the way they speak and boast in, in God, you feel like, wow, they're so holy. Oh, truly. You fasted for that long. <gasps> you prayed for this amount of time. Oh, you saw Jesus at the end of your bed. <gasps> They've got this special connection with God, a special relationship that you couldn't possibly have. They're just a funnel, you know, and thinking, oh God, if only you would have that with me. But God says, I'm no respecter of persons. They, it's the, they're boasting about the imaginations and the deceitfulness of their own heart. But don't mistake, when you're listening to them, you're thinking, oh, God's forgotten me. Oh, I don't have any of that. They don't either. It's an imagination. It's a false vision. It's not God. They love to say things like this. And we'll finish with this. I think we'll finish. Oh, three concluding points. Okay. Isn't it good to be back in church on a real format? <laughs> Here we go. They love to say this. You'll have heard this if you've been in Pentecostal circles. God's showing me, Mark. God's showing me what uh, it's coming in your life. God's leading you this way and that way. Um, God's going to powerfully use you in South America as a missionary. I remember these are all real examples. God's going to use you powerfully as a missionary in South America. As far as I know to this day, They've never gone to South America, no interest in going to South America, have never been, never happened. Another one they say is, oh, God's going to powerfully use you to write a book, stroking your pride. Oh, I'm going to write a book that's going to influence people, that's great. The book was never written, never happened, another false prophecy. You'll have an AIDS ministry is another one I've heard. You're going to have an AIDS ministry. Mate, they couldn't even stand the sight of blood, you know what I mean? They, were, they never got near anywhere near an AIDS ministry never happened. Uh, a couple came forward and you'll see this multiple times if you're looking at these sort of programs. A couple comes up and says, uh, look, and they're broken, maybe crying, especially the wife. Uh, we'd love to have children, but we can't. And so these guys begin to boast. They say, well, do you want a boy or a girl? What colour hair? Right, boy or a girl? Yeah, they tell them, they go through the ship. This time next year, come back and testify about the birth of that child. They walk off, hi, oh, oh, thank you, Lord. And I, listen, it's another area I have to say, I, I, have, I know a guy with a ministry that where many people who the doctors said couldn't have children, he prayed for them and they had children within 12 months. I have seen that happen, but these guys do it on a regular basis. But think about what they're setting up here. They're saying on the platform, and the guy, sorry, that, that had, makes no, he doesn't make a fuss about it. You know what I mean? God just instruct him, pray that way, pray, and the children come as a matter of fact. But these guys set it up. 12 months' time, come back, testify about this. Now think about what's going on in the parent's mind. 12 months' time, they have this child, they come back. Who gets the glory? He gets the glory for the prayer, doesn't he? Wonderful. Oh, look what the Lord has done. See the power that my ministry holds. Wonderful. Send me more money if you want these sort of miracles. Wonderful. 
But in 12 months' time, if they don't have that child, whose fault is that? Because it's not his fault. You don't have enough faith to receive that child. And he put these people under condemnation that God never put these people under. But this is how they operate in ministry, the hallmarks of a false prophet. These people leave their money at the altar and they go home without any of the promises that have been talked about. No miracles. Why? Because they're not miracles that God has promised. Lastly, three concluding points, and we'll be quick with that. It says, false prophets, if we go to 2 Timothy while you're there, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 3. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 3. Okay. False prophets are a judgment, God's judgment specifically on a nation. If you don't know the time or the hour in which we live, look at Christian TV. Because in Jeremiah's time, it was just before judgment when these things come out. That's when the true word of the Lord comes. Judgment is coming. Prepare yourself. Make straight the paths of the Lord. And they come out of the woodwork in response to that because they can't talk about sin, they can't talk about repentance, they don't want to acknowledge, oh, we've done something wrong, we need to come back to the Lord, or we rejected him in every form of society, we want sexual freedom, we want freedom from God. Take this shackle out from under us. These are people of the churches that are saying that. We don't want to live, we want a God that's fashioned in our own right. Let's get rid of that. As soon as that happens, false prophets come and tell them the very words they want to hear. In fact, we seek it out. Listen to this. For the time will come where they will not endure sound doctrine. That is, true preaching, the word of God that's been preached for 2,000 years, this time is coming where they're not going to endure that which has been preached since the time of Jesus. They're not going to endure that. What are they going to do? But rather, after their own lusts and desires, just like the false prophets, they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned under fables. Listen, people are not just going to uh, be deceived oh, I don't, you know, that truth, I can't grasp that truth no, they say that truth doesn't fit my desires, let's put God's truth to the side and get a teacher that's going to teach me and talk about Jesus and the Most High but he's really talking about my desires and if there's ever a day we can heap up these teachers, you can collect this one and that one and this one, get on YouTube and listen to this one and they'll tell you over and over again what a wonderful person you are and how God has a great plan for your life and how you're deemed for earthly greatness. Come on, how many people are deemed for earthly greatness? Really, look through history. How many people have endured? There's names that, were, that I think are great in history. I could tell my children they wouldn't know who they were. We're deemed for the greatness of God and the glory of God while we live here. But we might have a, a life that is so menial, simply caring for a disabled child. What if that's the ministry God gave to you? What if it's simply raising up your family godly? That might be the ministry God's given to you. Be faithful in what he put in your hand. Okay, the second one, in concluding points, is true prophets always preach God's word. Do you know Jeremiah actually says it, that these false prophets strengthen the hands of evildoers. They give people who are immoral, whose integrity is unjust, they give them a license to do it more and with a clean conscience because they lightly heal their affliction. They don't deal with the real issues. Jeremiah 23, 23, the whole chapter is about false prophets. But anyway, let's take it 23. Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord God, and not a God afar off? Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, says the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? I have heard what the prophets said, that prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed a dream. Woo! Dreamed a dream. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of deceit of their own heart, which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbour 
as their fathers have forgotten my name for Baal. The prophet had have dream, let him tell a dream, and he that had a word, let him speak the word faithfully. If you think you've got one and you think it's from God, speak the thing. But listen to this, what God says. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? Therefore, behold, I'm against these prophets, saith the Lord, that steal my words, every one from his name. If you have a penchant for these words of dreams and all that sort of stuff, God says this to you. Listen, he makes a comparison. He says, one's wheat and one's chaff. Chaff is worthless stuff that just blows away in the breeze. The wheat can be digested and eaten. He's saying, this is my word, my scriptures, my Bible. This is the words of the Lord documented. Don't exceed what is written. And if you have one of these things, that's great. But what is wheat to chaff? Have you had a dream? Good on you. Have you had a vision? Good on you. But listen, what's your wheat to the chaff? The real exalted thing should be the word of God. The word of God is the exalted thing. Third one, and we finish with this. The, what's the real message? If they lightly heal the, the wounds of these people, then what is the real message? The real message is this. God is a holy God. We're not, um, we're not looking at God and voting. Oh, I like this bit. I like it when he gives to the poor. I like it when he heals the sick. But when he plats the whip and drives them out of the temple for the money changes, that's, that's not God. That's not loving. You know what I mean? When he talks and tells them they're a brood of vipers and a whitewashed tomb, that's, that's not Jesus. When he tells and invades about your sexuality and how you should conduct yourself in marriage and Christian when you're looking for partners, well, that, that's, that, that's not God. And they begin to fashion God in their own image, remake him again in God's image. We're not voting. God's not getting a vote to see whether you like him or not. God says this, I am what I am and I change not. You either get on board with God or you don't get on board with God, but you don't remake God in your own image, no, one way or the other. The second part of the message is this, uh, that he's a God of mercy and he invites everyone to come, even through the book of Jeremiah. And we said last time when we look at it, for every four words of judgment, there's two words of mercy. In the latter days, the judgment, words of judgment come stronger than the words of mercy. But still, time and time again, Jeremiah pleads, would you just stop this? Just return to the Lord and this judgment will stop. Your family will live. You'll get carried away. Just stop and we won't see the destruction of Jerusalem. God will relent from his anger. And they won't listen. They won't listen. But God is inviting today. That's the message. God is holy, but he invites you to come in your unholiness that he might make you righteous. I'll end with this story. Simon Wiesenthal, I don't know whether some of you know, he, he was a Holocaust um, survivor. And in the camp, uh, one time, a Nazi, young German Nazi was dying and in his dying state, he asked Simon Wiesenthal, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, um, can he forgive him for what they've, they've done to the Jews? And Simon Wiesenthal said, he said no, and walked out of the room, and then young, young Nazi died. And after the, uh, the event, he sort of I uh, was pondering about it and was unsure, so he wrote a number of letters to different theologians, different um, biblical teachers and things along those lines for their views. But ultimately, maybe, maybe Simon Wiesenthal was right because ultimately all sin is against God and you must first seek forgiveness from God. Then the peace comes. Then you make recompense to those that are around you and you must speak to the injured parties to seek forgiveness. Is that right? If I abuse my family, I can't then come and ask forgiveness from Pete. I must seek it from my wife, from my children to receive forgiveness. I don't know the state of that young Nazi's soul at the end of his life. But I do know this, that God invites all those that are weary with sin, with guilt and with shame to come unto him and receive true healing, true peace, 
not the peace that these guys say because they say peace, peace where there is no peace but God says peace in the midst of the most violent storm in your life and this supernatural peace will part, that surpasses all understanding resides in your heart and mind and you will never receive that peace until you come under God and surrender your life to him if you've never done that seek him out Jesus says come come lay down the idols lay down the immorality you know lay down the lying lips the secrets the things done in hidden the shame things lay those down come with those idols like I said last week and let the power of the Holy Spirit break them in the presence of God that you might be free in Jesus Christ Father we thank you Lord for your word God we pray Father that we will be mindful of these things in this last days when we have uh, so many teachings so many prophecies so many dreams so many visions uh, discerning what's of you and what's not of you Father let's keep it simple according to your word God better that we hear a vision and reject it on the basis of your word and be wrong than to accept the vision that's wrong and be led astray Father Give us wisdom in this age in which we live, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.